A story from the second chapter of John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for forty-six years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is a story of our faith. There's a new edition resting in the center of our dining room table. On a small purple cloth sits a lit candle and two story cards one depicting Jesus' birth, and another his first trip to the temple in Jerusalem at the age of 12. Each evening, we light the candle, tell the story, and eat. We sit together imagining others of our Fairfield family around their tables, telling the same story, singing the same grace. We pray the carpenter's son is building a bigger table in our congregation. Now a few thousand years before, other tables sit in another kind of worship space, the temple of Jesus' time. The carpenter's son comes raging to these tables, overturns them, sends money flying. He rants, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Here, Jesus takes down the tables, deconstructs what the religious system has constructed. Were the money changers surprised? I wonder if they did not see themselves as contaminants, but servants of the God of the temple. How do we know if what we do is of God or not? Let's back up the truck a bit and look at the practices of the temple. Can we discern what sparked Jesus' vigorous attack? In the court of the Gentiles, which was the only part of the temple where Gentiles could worship, sit vendors and money changers. Vendors sell sacrificial animals to pilgrims. The money changers exchange Roman coins stamped with the image of the emperor for the imageless coins so that the temple tax can be paid. All of these activities are sanctioned by the temple authorities to presumably support the institution of the temple they believe themselves to be acting faithfully. This version of Jesus turning the temples has significant differences from the ones written in the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John's version is the first public act of Jesus' ministry. The one before, turning water into wine, was a private gathering. This placement emphasizes its significance. The other Gospels place the story in the last week of Jesus' life and stress price gouging and financial manipulation. John only refers to marketplace. From the beginning of the Gospel of John, 
John establishes Jesus as prophet, the one who speaks for God, as priest, the one who presides over activities of the religious community, and as king, Messiah, the one who will establish God's rule, not only in the temple, but in the world. As prophet, Jesus declares the need to move away from meaningless ritual to divine devotion. As priest, he removes the need for money changing and animal sacrifice as an avenue to be in relationship with God. As Messiah, he establishes a new way through himself to live out faith and devotion to God. Okay, back to the table. If we are creating a table, a church, that is faithful to the way of Jesus, it requires us to keep on asking the same basic questions through all our iterations and transitions. Is this the way of the one who proclaims the way? Is this the way of the one who shows us true worship? The way of the one who shows how to live a devoted life? Is this the way of the prophet, the priest, and the Messiah? <laughs> At this point, I get queasy. There have been many times in the life of the church when we thought we were doing all of these things. At least, that's what we thought in the beginning, just as the temple authorities thought that exchanging Roman coins for temple coins and selling sacrificial animals was faithful. I remember as a child sitting in our small town church. I listened to a missionary talk about raising money for schools for Indian children so that they have books and desks and food. I'm on fire wanting to help these kids who are like me but poor and unfortunate. I give my money directly to the missionary, sure that my actions illustrate compassion and faith. Fast forward 45 years and I sit in another place of worship. I listen to Willie Blackwater tell a gathering of church folk about his life of deprivation and abuse at the Indian Residential School run by the United Church in Port Alberni. I speak to Jessie Oliver, a teacher at that school. She says she had no idea what was happening there. She thought she was doing God's work. How do we know that the tables we build, the ministries we establish, the churches we construct are of God. Like you, I long to be with Jesus, binding the cords into whips, routing out what is rotten and profane, both inside and outside the church. I don't want to be sidled along with the marketers and the money changers, having my life, my church, turned upside down. The text pushes us, however, to imagine Jesus entering our own sanctuaries, turning over our own cherished rationalizations, and driving us out in the name of God. It seems important for us to tolerate and explore through prayer, conversations, council meetings, and study, the anxiety-inducing image of Jesus with a whip of cords in the temple, knowing that he is speaking for us, yes, 
and with us, yes, but also to and even against us. So how do we know that the tables we built, the ministries we establish, the communities we construct are of God? The answer is familiar, but still disquieting. We keep on asking ourselves, is this the ministry of Jesus Christ? We test with those outside the church. We check with children and with the most vulnerable in our community. We listen to the voices of the disgruntled instead of constantly seeking out the voices of affirmation. We pray. We at Fairfield are in the perfect place to live out this questioning, discerning reality. We have begun a new ministry called Table Church, where our dream is to make the table of Jesus Christ bigger so that we can learn and experience the presence of God more fully in our day-to-day -day existence. And we're about to enter a time of construction for our worshiping space. Our dream is that this space will not over only bless our worshiping life together, but be a space of hope and nourishment for the wider community. We pray the design and construction of these metaphorical tables come from the son of the carpenter, that they bear his stamp. Last Sunday, as Beth and I were handing out the table church boxes, I stood across another table. A curious 30-something man approached me, wondering what we were doing there. I started to give him the 30-second promo. We are part of Fairfield United Church, and we are giving our members a box which contains material that will help them celebrate Lent. Well, that was as far as I got before he wanted to know if Lent was a time where you only ate lentils. We were off talking about Lent, how long it is. That's a long time, he said. Stories of Jesus, the light, etc. He asked if he could look at the box. He spent a long while looking at the story cards, reading the booklet, holding the cloth. Eventually, he asked if he could just take two things, the candle and the cloth, which he did. We say during communion that there are no barriers to the table of Jesus Christ, not age, not gender identity, not financial status, nor how sure our faith is at the moment. If this is so, can we hold this kind of gentleness around all of our rituals, ministries, and places? Can we welcome the stranger and not impose the whole box if they are not ready? Can we also hold our ministries, rituals, and spaces with the strength and purpose of the one who binds the cords? Clear about our values, our hopes for the ministries, solid in our commitment and devotion to God. I believe we can, but it will not be automatic. It will require grit, <laughs> courage, perseverance. Together, we can. So my friends, I pray that the tables of our homes, the ministries we form, the sanctuary space we construct, construct, be formed and reformed by the carpenter's son and through our love of God. Amen. Thank you.